You cannot miss out on this one. The viewers realize something and it's lifting the veil from the panel and revealing a side that we've seldom seen. Donald Trump looks unstoppable and the Iowa caucus is another painful reminder of that for The View, so what do they do? Well, just a few days ago, the entire panel, but especially Joy Behar and Whoopi Goldberg, tried hard to look the other way from the results while slinging mud at Trump's character. Just take a look at this. I can safely say, tonight, Iowa made this Republican primary a two-person race. <laughs> Yeah, between, between Trump and Biden. That's what it looked like to me. I, I don't know what she was referring to. I'm hoping for insight from the table, because I, I didn't know what she was talking about. Let me add a little perspective and, and context. That's very important. Mm -hmm. Only 5% of the population of the state caucuses. So when you see Iowa swept or Trump swept Iowa. No, he did not. He, he, tr he swept 5% of the population. That's an example of seeing what you want to see, and it's that selective lens that quickly robs them of any credibility they had left. The fact is, the Iowa caucus turnout was very much in range for the low expectations that caucuses have traditionally set, swinging from 15 to 20% on average. Granted, at a turnout of about 14.4%, it lies on the lower end of the spectrum, but if the percent of 5% as a ratio of the state's population seems underwhelming, here's a chart of the Democratic nomination caucus turnout back in 2016. From 0.7 to the highest number at 7.5% of the voting population in the same state of Iowa. You'll never see The View questioning the representation of the Democrats in the state by those figures, though, of course. Add to this the fact that this was the coldest day of the caucuses in the state in the last half century, and even the voter turnout of over 110,000 people looks like an impressive feat. It's that context and perspective you'll never find from a panel like The View. But then for some reason, Joy Behar had the idea of digging up all the dirt on Donald Trump she could find and slamming his voters for their choice. This is the moment that the show took a turn for the absurd, going off on a tangent with surface level jibes over welfare and abortion. Just watch this. This is what the 5% voted for. <clears throat> they voted for a guy who today had to come uh, to New York to show up in court in a case against a woman that a federal judge has already said he That is who you voted for. Yeah. You voted for someone who has lost so many times now that this applies to him. Um, let's see what else. You voted for a guy who said, come, risk your lives for the grand wizard. <laughs> Come in the snow and the sleet because I am more important than your life. That's who the 5% voted for. Notice the sly manipulation of language when describing that E. Jean Carroll case by Joy Behar. It's been discussed enough over time, but for some reason there's a blurring of the line by her between a criminal case versus the civil case that it was. There's a reason she didn't just call him guilty of assault because the law has very clear definitions for being liable for something versus being guilty. That's what the $5 million payment to E. Jean was under the law, while appeals against the judge's decision commenced from his side. But without going into much of the detail, it's an interesting case study in how easy it is to slightly twist language and end up with a very different connotation for the audience. One critical misstep there by Joy Behar, and she could have found herself in a defamation suit. Though, by the way, calling him the Grand Wizard as Joy just did is already walking a pretty thin line, and honestly, it's just tacky. People out there, I think, need to, un to understand that it's not just him. It's the Republican Party right now. It is in some kind of crazy phase where all they want to do is stick it to the Democrats and hope that, for example, this is what I wanted to say here, 15 of the Republican state governors currently opted out of a food assistance program that is going to leave 8 million needy children hungry. That is what the Republican Party is doing right now. Forget about the border for a second and concentrate for a minute on these anti-abortion people, anti-choice people who don't seem to care that 8 million children will be hungry. I don't know what the two have to do with each other. It's something you see way too often where somehow pro-life candidates are concerned over their stance on welfare programs, as if there's an obvious contradiction there. 
but there's not. And just the wording of the phrase as if those 15 governors actively want 8 million children to go hungry is the most low resolution political thinking that exists. And speaking of all of those hungry children, let's not even talk about the fact that the Biden administration is shipping in tons of children from other countries into the United States with no home, just to the middle of random cities. That's a different tangent. The Republican Party itself has never been that big on social welfare programs relative to the other side, but there may be a rationale there that a panel like The View would do well to explain, but I don't think they can, because adding to the needless polarization and demonization is how the panel retains any interest from their audience. I'm, I'm just, just, now, now, just, now I, didn't, I haven't said anything, Disappointing. so now I'm gonna say that. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. I do think that it, it is something that we knew was gonna happen. It's not a shock. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I do like the idea that it's 5% because, you know, where did everybody else go? They don't participate what was in the that? Well, that's, They stayed that's, home that's, in their pajamas. Well, that's the thing that, that you have to keep in mind. That's historically the number, by the way. 3 to 5% of Iowa participates in caucuses historically. So it's not but unusual. this was also a smaller yeah. turnout because than of the prior weather. because, right. of, because the weather. of the weather, but it's okay. not unusual. But There's a critical difference between the caucuses and the primaries that no one on this panel has yet demonstrated. The caucuses are usually held in a concentrated geographical area at a local and precinct level where the voters assemble. Whereas the primaries are scattered polling stations are easily accessible in every part of the state. That's why they've almost always had a very low voter turnout relative to the primaries, not just for one party, but for every party. And yet you see this entire segment trying to use that figure of 5% to somehow make a non-existent point. Echo chambers like this only reinforce what they already believe, which is why there's hardly any pushback they face when mangling language and statistics. This defamation trial that he's now facing again is because after he was found guilty of sexually assaulting her, he then defamed her again. Yeah, that's right. So he's smart. smart. You know, you're just so smart. smart. Your mouth Double closed, down. dude. You might, you might actually move forward, but who am I kidding? It's like seeing the panel jumping with joy at anything that confirms their preset narratives. The case with E. Jean Carroll is actually very complicated in a legal sense, which is why he's not called a convicted offender or have to register as one. But you don't even need to defend the man for anything. The fact is, the courts are taking their course, and no one needs to take the view's word over how they end up. As it stands now, Donald Trump is in the midst of the most decisive year of his life. From the cases and lawsuits to the most important election cycle for his political career, we're seeing a heating of the political arena every passing day. Along with many other names in the media, there's going to be people wanting to feed off of that hype, even if that means completely becoming a repository of bad partisan takes. If that's what The View has decided to become, then what we're seeing is probably the result of that. Trump's win and solidified lead in the Iowa caucus is predictably not going to sit well with a panel like this. He's trailing even his nearest competitor in the state by over 30 points, which just means that there's practically nothing to worry about for Trump when it comes to his nomination. It was that big margin that even led to someone like Vivek Ramaswamy just dropping out after realizing that he should join the side that he can't beat. Right now, the only thing standing between Trump and the Republican nomination is the legal cases and the media mudslinging, but certainly no worthy political challenger that can take him down, at least not within his own party.